We're going to look, though, at a very, very important topic. And as I mentioned, this is the start of really three messages that are, are, are separate, and yet they really work together and go together. So there'll be this afternoon, tomorrow morning early, and then tomorrow at 2 o'clock also. I was really tempted to call this talk A Reason to Exist. It was the year 1938. Dr. Toshio Yamagata and Elder Francis Millard of the Japan Union Mission met with Dr. Mizuno, who was the great educator and director of social and religious education for the nation of Japan. These men from the Adventist mission were there to ask Dr. Mizuno, the government leader, for permission to continue to keep the SDA school at the mission open at a time when most religious and parochial schools were being closed. They asked permission to continue to follow the radically different plan of education that was then in place, a plan that included the harmonious development of the physical, the mental, and the spiritual, a plan which we have been given counsel to follow in the book Education, but unfortunately we rarely see followed today. Dr. Mizuno, the government leader, answered them and said, I have already read your book, Education. I understand your plan. And he said in words both profound and convicting, quote, if you follow your plan, you have no reason to worry. If you do not follow your plan, you have no reason to exist. We have been given a plan a plan of education, a plan of health, a plan of evangelism. We could go right on down the list. A plan that will make us a peculiar people. A plan that is different from the world. A plan that will set us apart. And a plan that may even generate persecution and ridicule. A plan designed by God and instituted by God, given us by God, to prepare us for heaven and enable us to spread the gospel and finish the work on this earth. If we follow this plan, we have no reason to fear because it is God's plan. But if we do not follow the plan, we have no reason to exist. We may as well be just another denomination because if we seek to be like the world around us, we have taken away the very reason for our existence. We've been given an educational plan, a very simple plan, and it is one that gives us a reason to exist. And this afternoon, I'd like to take us through the very basics of this plan. Will you bow your heads with me? Father in heaven, thank you that we have the privilege and opportunity to look at your plan. Thank you that you have given us a plan. And Lord, I ask for a special measure of your Holy Spirit this afternoon. You know I need it, Lord. I pray that you will speak through me, you will fill me with your spirit. May I only share your words and nothing else. Please open our hearts and minds to understand your truth as we should. For I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Now, as never before, we read in the book Mind, Character, and Personality, now as never before, we need to understand the true science of education. If we fail to understand this, We shall never have a place in the kingdom of God. Is that reason enough to study the plan of true education? (laughs) We could stop right here and say that this must be critical. Never have a place in the kingdom of God without understanding the science of education? Now, okay, this should give us a bit of a definition, though, of what education and true education really is, though, because... This must be more than just what is conventionally defined as education. This must be more than study of the sciences and history and things like that. Because last I checked, God did not have algebra as an entrance requirement for heaven. Thankfully not. (laughs) Many of us would fail, probably. No, there must be way more to education than merely the study of academics. So perhaps it would be good to ask ourselves the question, what is the goal? To you, let me ask you. What is the goal of true education? Welcoming answers. Yes. 
to restore in us the image of God. Absolutely correct. Anyone else? Character development. What was that? Preparation for eternity? Absolutely. All correct answers. Yes? To know the character of God, His plan of salvation. Absolutely. Anyone else? You've all given correct answers. And in fact, if we study the spirit of prophecy and we boil it down, we can really deduce three main goals of true education. Did you have a comment? To know God's will. Absolutely, yes. Three main goals of true education if we really look at it in the spirit of prophecy. Here they are. Number one, true education and redemption are synonymous, meaning they are one. It is restoring the image of God in the soul. Where do I take that from? The book Education, page 30. In the highest sense, the work of education and the work of redemption are one. Point number two, true education is the harmonious development of the physical, the mental, and the spiritual powers. Again, from the book Education. True education is the harmonious development of the physical, the mental, and the spiritual powers. And thirdly, our, our, our third main point of true education is that true education is preparation for service here on this earth for the spread of the gospel and throughout eternity. You see, service won't end here on this earth. We will continue to engage in service in heaven. And again, from the book Education, true education prepares the student for the joy of service in this world and the higher joy of wider service in the world to come. Within these three principles, there are many other principles that we could fit in. But if it does not fit in with these three principles, then it may not be a part of the plan of true education. If we put it in a nutshell, I believe it would look something like this. It is cultivating the entire person to be Christ-like, that's the plan of redemption, and preparing them, and the entire person is the physical, mental, and spiritual, preparing them for service in this world and in heaven. Really, in a nutshell, true education has nothing to do with how many degrees you have, how many classes you've taken, how much time you've spent in school, whether you have a nice house and a job, or any of those other things. Not that there's anything wrong with those things, but they're not a fundamental part of what true education really means. Is that clear? Does that make sense? Excellent. So now I'd like to unpack each one of these points individual. This is a framework for our talk this afternoon understanding each one of these points and what it means to us from the spirit of prophecy, the Bible, and science. Point number one, that true education and redemption are synonymous. So let's, let's unpack this a bit. We read that in the highest sense, the work of education and redemption are one. What does it mean for something to be one? It's the same thing, right? If one thing is true, then the other will also be true because the two things have become one. The true object, we read in Christian education, the true object of education is to restore the image of God in the soul. Why so? That's because we were created in the image of God, right? And so we have to, God has to bring us back to what we were created for, and that's the process of redemption. And we're also told that that is the process of education and the process of life. Education equals redemption. They are the one, one and the same. True education needs to fit us for earthly life, but it must also fit us for heavenly life. The book of Proverbs tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. It's very easy for us to gloss over this. We say, oh yes, we must have, have Bible class. <laughs> is that what this is saying, really? I think it's much deeper than that. It is the beginning of wisdom. It's where you start. You want your child or yourself to gain wisdom and understanding? Begin with the study of God's Word and understanding who God is. In Deuteronomy, God tells His people to dil diligently instruct their children in His ways and His laws in the evening when they got home from work, right? How often did He tell them to instruct his ch their children about God? When you sat down, when you r rise up, when you lay down, it, all throughout the day. It was to be a part of everyday life to instruct the children about God. We read that the Bible should be made the foundation of study and teaching. What is a foundation? Suppose you're building a house and uh, you said, you know what? No one's going to see the foundation. Why do I need to spend so much time on it? And so you said, you just did a real quick job with the foundation. You did not lay a good foundation. Would people know? 
Is it true that no one saw that? Yes, it's true. Nobody saw the foundation. But would people see the results of it? After time, absolutely. When the house wall is crooked or the roof starts caving in, whatever happens, they will know that you did not lay a good foundation. The Bible should be the foundation of study and teaching. In our schools, in our homes, as we build that house of character, we must make the Bible the foundation. The essential knowledge is, what do you think? A knowledge of God and of Him whom He has sent. And in reality, if we look back through history, all the greatest men of the world who have come up with the brightest ideas, were they any surprise to God? <laughs> was, was God like, whoa, that's a really neat discovery? <laughs> No, I'm pretty sure he knew about it, did he not? God is the foundation of wisdom, and as we seek to understand true wisdom, God will lead us because he is the source. The first great lesson in true education is to do what? To know and understand the will of God. Take the knowledge of God with you into every day of life. Let it absorb the mind and the whole being. God gave Solomon wisdom, but this God-given wisdom was perverted when he turned from God to obtain wisdom from other sources. Interesting that wisdom can be perverted. True wisdom comes from God, but if we turn from God to obtain wisdom from other sources, we're perver perverting wisdom. So, as the book Education tells us, instead of confining their study to that which men have said or written, let students be directed to the sources of truth. Where are the sources of truth? God's Word. Very simple. And yet we spend the majority of our time studying what other men have said or written in college and, and school and education conventionally today, do we not? Let us go to the source. The Bible should be made the foundation of education. We want to lay that good foundation that I mentioned earlier. By some, education is placed next to religion. Do we consider that education has its place and religion has its place? That's not correct. True education is religion. The power and soul of true education is a knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ whom he has sent. The science of true education is the truth, which is to be so deeply impressed on the soul that it cannot be obliterated by the error that everywhere abounds. True education is the inculcation of those ideas that will impress the mind and heart with the knowledge of God the Creator and Jesus Christ the Redeemer. Such an education will renew the mind and transform the character. Do we want renewed minds and transformed characters? What will do this? True education. It will strengthen and fortify the mind against the deceptive whisperings of the adversary of souls and enable us to understand the voice of God. Do we want strengthened and fortified minds? Do we want to be able to understand the voice of God? What will do this? True education. It will fit the learned to become a co-worker with Christ. We want to work with God. What will do this? true education. So, we ask now, we ask everyone to take hold of this matter interestedly so that we shall soon have a place where our children can study the Bible, which is the foundation of all true education. The fear of the Lord, the very first lesson to be taught, is the beginning of wisdom. Do your children have a place where they can study the Bible? The home or the school, either one, that should be the foundation. Our second main point under true education is the harmonious development of the physical, the mental, and the spiritual. We're going to spend a bit more time on this because it is a very large topic. What does it mean for something to develop harmoniously? Let's say we have a quartet that is singing, and the tenor decides to sing louder than the rest of them. Is that now harmonious? No, very inharmonious. Probably doesn't sound very good at all. Let's say we plant three trees. And uh, two of the trees grow this tall, while the other one grows as tall as this building. Is that harmonious growth? No, it is not. So if a person studies his Bible for 30 minutes, gets some exercise for 20 minutes, and spends the rest of his day in class, do you think that's harmonious development of the physical, mental, and spiritual? It's not. And yet, conventional education, we do it every day, Tim says. <laughs> conventional education tends to focus on the mental. We read earlier, no, we didn't, sorry, this, is, this comes from Christ's Object Lessons. True education is the preparation of the physical, mental, and moral powers. Why? Because we want performance of every duty. It's the training of body, mind, and soul. Why? For divine service. 
This is the education that will endure into eternal life. Notice she says it twice there, physical, mental, and moral, body, mind, and soul, as if we needed to just have that point uh, very clear. <clears throat> True education means more than taking the certain course of study. It is broad, and it includes the harmonious development of all the physical powers and mental faculties. It teaches the love and fear of God and is a preparation for the faithful discharge of life's duties. We find in child guidance that in childhood and youth, practical and literary training should be combined. Now, I found this very interesting. What does it mean to combine something? Suppose you're making a recipe, and it calls for rice and beans. And so you take your measurement of rice, and you dump it into the bowl. You take your measurement of beans, and you dump that into the bowl, and you mix it up. Have you just combined rice and beans? You have, yeah. That's what it means to combine something. So then, after you've done the combining, is it now very easy to take the beans out of the mixture? It's not. They're blended together. They're combined. So combining practical and literary training, this to me says that we shouldn't just have our academic class and our practical class, but we should blend the two and be teaching the two together which we don't have time to really explain how that works, uh, but this is something I think we should really push forward in our schools. It's something I've done at the school I've worked with in Africa. We're teaching the teachers how to take the lessons they have in the classroom, the academic studies, and teach them through the gardening and the vocational skills and the various things that they're training. This is how it really should be done. But when it comes to physical activity, there's incredible research that shows how powerful this is. I mentioned the, the uh, cerebellum a couple of days ago. We've already seen that, but there's more. The hippocampus is another area very impacted by physical activity. One study found that uh, higher fit children showed greater bilateral hippocampal volumes and superior relational memory task performance compared to lower fit children. That's a fancy scientific way of simply saying that children who got more activity and were more fit had larger hippocampuses and better memories. Another study found that physical activity can improve the overall mental health and quality of life, can enhance brain function and cognition, improve behavior, improve concentration, increase blood and oxygen flow to the brain, Increase the levels of norepinephrine and endorphins, resulting in a reduction of stress and an improvement of mood. Increase growth factors that help create synaptic, sorry, help create new nerve cells and support synaptic plasticity. Physical activity is a powerful learning tool. In fact, we know that in early childhood, we literally have to have physical activity combined with academic training for the academic training to even progress, and that's because of something known as the proprioceptive system. Exercise provides an unparalleled stimulus, creating an environment in which the brain is ready, willing, and able to learn. We read in Child Guidance that both mental and spiritual vigor are in a great degree dependent upon physical strength and activity. Mental and spiritual vigor, two very important things in education. What are they dependent on? Physical strength and activity. Whatever promotes physical health promotes the development of a strong mind and a well-balanced character. We value character, right? That's our goal in true education, is a well-developed character. And what promotes the strong mind and well-balanced character? Physical activity. The whole body is designed for action. And unless the physical powers are kept in health by active exercise, the mental powers cannot long be used to their highest capacity. Students should not even be permitted, it says to take so many studies that they will have no time for physical training. The health cannot be preserved unless some portion of each day is given to muscular exertion in the open air. Stated hours should be devoted to manual labor of some kind. We should not even allow students to take more studies than, will, um, you know, than that would prevent them from taking time for physical training. And this is a major change that needs to occur in education. I believe that we need to recognize the value of manual labor, not for its monetary value, but for its character and educational value. There is a difference. I'm sure you're aware that great majority of our academies and universities have removed the agriculture component and often the um, practical training component too. Why so? What's the number one reason given? No money. Not making any money, exactly. I was talking with a friend of mine who's an educator and has worked with many schools, and he says, or maybe not many, he's worked with a few, and he said, uh, you know, we're always saying that agriculture isn't making us money, and so we remove that from the program. 
he says nobody ever asked if history class made us money. Nobody ever asked if math class made us money. Why do we not ask if these classes make us money? Because we view them as fundamental aspects of education. Making money or not, we better keep them. So what's that say about our value of agriculture or practical labor? Maybe we don't see it as a fundamental part of education. And besides, agriculture can make us money, and I have yet to see a history class that made anyone any money. <laughs> <laughs> the time of study must be divided, we're told, between the gaining of book knowledge and a securing of a knowledge of practical work. This is speaking of the work at Avondale in Australia. It says, part of each day was spent in useful work. The students learning how to clear the land, how to cultivate the soil, and how to build houses. And the Lord blessed the students who thus devoted their time to learning lessons of usefulness. Physical training, if we want to focus, we have the physical, the mental, and the spiritual. And I just want to narrow in a bit on physical training for a moment. There's three categories that I find in the spirit of prophecy, generalized here. There's useful work, and that is just the everyday activities that we find where children, young people need to know how to be useful, take care of their homes and such. There's manual training where we're actually training a skill or a trade that these young people can take. And there's also the teaching of how to keep our bodies healthy and the treatment of disease. We're told that every man, woman, and child should be educated to practical, useful work. And also, that the greatest benefit is not gained from exercise that is taken as play or exercise merely. You see, we take away the uh, manual arts training programs, and what do we replace them with? Gyms and sports. And please don't think I'm being critical here, but I'm just helping us understand that that is really not where we gain the most benefit. There is some benefit in being in the fresh air and also from the exercise of the muscles, but let the same amount of energy be given to the performance of useful work and the benefit will be greater. Students who have gained book knowledge without gaining a knowledge of practical work cannot lay claim to a symmetrical education. A student who has graduated with this great degree and yet they don't have a knowledge of practical work, they cannot even claim that they have a complete and symmetrical education. Physical employment is part of the training essential for every youth. An important phase of education is lacking if the student is not taught how to engage in useful labor. There's useful work, but there's also manual training. This is very interesting. Useful manual labor is part of the gospel plan. Pretty important, isn't it? Part of the gospel plan? The great teacher gave directions to Israel that every youth should be taught some line of useful employment. They might be instructed in literary lines, but they must also be trained to some craft. This was deemed an indispensable part of their education. This is speaking of the nation of Israel. You were a bad parent if you didn't give your child a manual training so that they left your home with a trade. It was just considered poor education if you didn't do that. This should be started in the home, of course. But then, when the child is old enough to be sent to school, the teacher should cooperate with the parents, and manual training should be continued as part of the school studies. Manual training is of deserving of far more attention than it has received. And there are many different lines of manual training we find in the spirit of prophecy, how to cook well, sewing, carpentry, but most important is agriculture. According to the book Child Guidance, no line of manual training is of more value than agriculture. A greater effort should be made to create and encourage an interest in agricultural pursuits. Let the teacher call attention to what the Bible says about agriculture, that it was God's plan for man to till the earth, that the first man, the ruler of the whole world, was given a garden to cultivate, and that many of the world's greatest men, its real nobility, have been the tillers of the soil. Show the opportunities in such a life. But why agriculture? Why is this so important to us? I, I mean, isn't this old-fashioned? Like, who really in the modern world is growing a garden and involved in agriculture? Well, let's find out from science. It was Thomas Jefferson, third president of the United States, who said no nation will long survive the decay of its agriculture. Now, superficially, this would be true. A nation must be able to grow food to support itself. But I wonder if there's more than just growing food going on here. Question for you. Who was the first gardener? You sure it was Adam? Who planted the Garden of Eden? 
It was God. God was the first gardener. Adam was the first human gardener. But God planted a garden eastward in Eden. This comes from the incredible book by E.A. Sutherland, Living Fountains or Broken Cisterns. God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and from the beauties of the earth chose the most beautiful spot for the home of the new pair. From the beauties of the earth, it says. Now, I think I'm safe saying this here in New Zealand. I certainly believe that New Zealand may be one of the most beautiful countries on earth, especially the South Island. Now, God could have chosen... I'm sorry, are there any Australians here? <laughs> Oops. <laughs> there are many beautiful places in the world, but New Zealand is really close to the best. Either way, though, God could have chosen anywhere to put them. He could have put them in New Zealand. He could have put them in the Swiss Alps, wherever it may be. But where did he put them? In a garden. In the midst of the garden stood the tree of life, the fruit of which afforded man a perfect physical food. Beneath its spreading branches, God himself visited them, and talking with them face to face, revealed to them the way of immortality. As they ate of the fruit of the tree of life and found every physical want supplied, they were constantly reminded of the need of the spiritual meat, which was gained by open converse with the light of heaven. According, notice, according to the divine system of teaching, they were here to study the laws of God and learn of his character. A divine system of teaching. Surely there's more here than just growing food and eating it. And in fact, research has found that children involved in gardening had better self-confidence and self-esteem. Now, again, let me clarify, self-esteem um, in the research is referring to a good thing. This is not an unhealthy, prideful self-esteem. This is a sense of self-worth, which every child needs to have. They were more patient, more persevering. They had improved science understanding and better test scores and overall better learners simply from spending more time in the garden. In fact, one study found an experimental group of, non, of gardening students outperformed a control group of non-gardening students in all areas, general information, reading recognition, reading comprehension, total reading, mathematics, spelling, and written language. What do any of those things have to do with gardening? I don't know. Multiplication? Yeah, you could include some of that for sure. The point here is that something about gardening was making these students better learners and was improving test scores and things that really didn't have a whole lot to do with gardening. Another study found substantial data suggesting that outdoor activities have positive effects on self-esteem and mental health. Now, there are various reasons for this. Some common sense. Uh, you know, if we look back at this list, how might children become more patient with gardening? Well, there's no app that produces tomatoes when you push a button. <laughs> you actually have to plant the seed and water it and cultivate it and eventually harvest if you're careful. Teaching them perseverance, again, that's obvious. Science understanding, there's so much science you can learn in the garden. There are many things, but when it comes to just making them better learners and smarter overall, scientists really aren't quite exactly sure, except they think they may have found some very small clues known as Mycobacterium vaccae. This is a certain bacteria that we find that will actually reduce depression, improve lung health, boost the immune system, fight cancer, strengthen the digestive system, treat arthritis, improve emotional and mental health, lower stress and anxiety, reduce allergies, and to top it off, make you smarter. The world's wonder drug, right? Everyone's looking for a pill that will give them this. Well, you won't find it in your health food store. Any ideas where you'll get this bacterium? Dirt. Dirt. It is the dirt in which our gardens grow. One study found that the M. Vaque, the Mycobacterium Vaque, had the exact same effect as antidepressant drugs. And notice the title of this article, Dirt is the New Prozac. <laughs> Literally, the same physiological changes in the brain from gaining this bacteria. Another study found that compared to those who did not ingest the bacterium, the mice that did ingest it navigated a maze twice as fast and exhibited half of the anxiety behaviors. So they were not only smarter and faster, but were less stressed throughout the process. So where do you get this? It comes from dirt. We find that walking barefoot in the garden, we can help absorb it in our feet, under our toenails, putting your hands in the dirt. They've done treatment programs with patients who are depressed where they literally just have them soak their hands in the dirt and find that it cures the depression often. Um, and we also know that the skin of the vegetables that we grow will absorb some of this bacteria. And um, 
So, you know, if you're growing organically and you don't have a lot of dirt on the vegetables, you can just brush them off. Don't bother really washing them really well. Um, you know, please make sure they're clean and organic, but um, don't scrub them if you don't have to, and you'll get more of this bacteria. So, evidently, getting dirty actually makes you smarter. So, next time your kid comes in and he's covered with mud, stop thinking about all the washing you have to do and think about how much smarter they're getting. <clears throat> They've also found that exposure to this naturally occurring bacteria can boost our immune systems. Did you have a question? Uh -huh. Healthy soil, healthy food, healthy people. Absolutely. That's, that's very good. But they've also found, this is very interesting, that exposure to this bacteria can boost our immune systems. One study in the New England Journal of Medicine found that these data support the idea that the greater diversity of microbial exposure among children who live on farms is associated with protection from the development of asthma. Fascinating, because isn't asthma... Doesn't that uh, asthma and allergies also, sorry, this quote isn't saying it, but they, they find that children who live on farms typically have less than half the incidence of allergies and asthma compared to those who live in the city. Allergies and asthma. Aren't allergies from the pollen that you're getting outdoors? They actually find that as we're exposed to it in early childhood, the body will build up an immune response to what we're being exposed to. And so it actually begins to reduce the uh, incidence of allergies and asthma. So these studies, according to Dr. Chris Lowry at the University of Bristol, these studies help us understand how the body communicates with the brain and why a healthy immune system is important for maintaining mental health. They also leave us wondering if we shouldn't all be spending more time playing in the dirt from a scientist. <laughs> and besides, there are many things. Just think about how many concepts you can learn in the garden. Take math. How about counting seeds or plants, measuring the rows and figuring out how many seeds to plant, measuring how far apart to plant the seeds, measuring the height of a seedling, counting how many vegetables are harvested. Do you have to do any of those things as part of gardening? No, obviously they're not essential. But you can, I'm just giving these as illustrations of how much you can teach if you're intentional and creative about it in the garden. Science, think about how much science you can learn. You can observe and predict the growth of plants, Learn about the parts of the plant and the purpose of each. Learn about photosynthesis, meteorology, the solar system, bugs and other critters, not through pictures, but through real life observation. The cycle of plant life through composting. Many things that can be learned in the garden. And this is one of the incredible benefits of country living. We have been counseled to move our families to the country. Teaches us an awareness of the world and the environment. Helps develop the power of attention in children. Teaches responsibility, cause to affect reasoning, industry, economy, diligence. I'm naming all these things in quick bullet point lists, but there is science to back up every one of them. Country living is the powerful uh, learning environment that God has designed for our children. The Garden of Eden, according to a pamphlet in the Spirit of Prophecy, the Garden of Eden was not only Adam's dwelling, but his schoolroom. God didn't place Adam there just, oh, I just needed a house to put Adam in. No, this was his schoolroom. And of course, we're told that study in agricultural lines should be the A, B, and C. Evidently, we shouldn't just start with it with the A. We should start with it and do another starting with B and another <laughs> with C. The A, B, and C, the beginning of the educational work of our school. This is the very first work that must be entered upon. Then, as we shall advance and add to our facilities, advanced studies and object lessons should come in. We are not to subtract from that which has already been taken hold of as a branch of education. And our third area of physical training is that of health and body. Children should be early taught in simple, easy lessons the rudiments of physiology and hygiene. The work should be begun by the mother in the home and carefully carried forward in the school. They should understand the importance of guarding against disease by preserving the vigor of every organ and should also be taught how to deal with common diseases and accidents. Every school should give instruction in both physiology and hygiene and so far as possible should be provided with facilities for illustrating the structure, use, and care of the body. That is something that I think we could spend uh, more time on in education now, teaching children how to care for themselves and how to treat sickness in others, training them to be medical missionaries. 
Secondly, we have physical, mental, and spiritual. Now, we spend a lot of time on mental training in schools. I don't think we have to convince ourselves of the importance of mental training. It absolutely is important. But I think it's very interesting what the focus of our mental training should be. According to Christian education, speaking of teachers, it says that while teachers need no less of piety, they also need a thorough knowledge of the sciences. This will make them not only good, practical Christians, but will enable them to educate the youth, and at the same time, they will have heavenly wisdom to lead them to the fountain of living waters. He is a Christian who aims to reach the highest attainments for the purpose of doing others good. This is the reason we gain physical, mental, or spiritual training, the purpose of doing others good. Knowledge harmoniously blended with a Christ-like character will make a person truly a light to the world. Education balanced by a solid religious experience fits the child of God to do his appointed work steadily, firmly, understandingly. If one is learning of Jesus, the greatest educator the world ever knew, he will not only have a symmetrical Christian character, but a mind trained to effectual labor. Again, there's our purpose, effectual labor for the master. Minds that are quick to discern will go deep beneath the surface. And thirdly, spiritual development. We cannot leave this out. This is, you know, we started with that as a major aspect of true education, restoring the image of God in the soul, redemption, education being the same thing. But we mustn't leave this out of our threefold purpose of education, spiritual development. The great object of education, sorry, the great object to be secured should be the proper development of character, that the individual may be fitted rightly to discharge the duties of the present life and have success in the world. Is that what that says? No. And to enter at last upon the future immortal life. We need to be preparing our children for heaven. True education is a failure if it doesn't prepare children for heaven. Any effort that exalts intellectual culture above moral training is misdirected. The first great lesson in all education is to know and understand the will of God. And there are three ways which we can do that. Go to the book Education, page 267, and you'll find them there. I don't have time to get into it. Three ways in which we can know and understand the will of God. It should be part of education. We should bring into every day of life the effort to gain this knowledge. A character formed according to the divine likeness is the only treasure that we can take from this world to the next. There's not much we can take to heaven but we can take our characters. How important then is the development of character in this life? Character building is the most important work ever entrusted to human beings. And never before was its diligent study so important as now. Our third main and final point of true education is that true education is preparation for service here on this earth and throughout eternity. The book Ministry of Healing, page 395, tells us true education is... Now, when I read something like that, I get excited. Aha, a definition of education. What do you think it says? True education is. Are you ready? Definition? Missionary training. Missionary training. Every son and daughter of God, are you a son and daughter of God? Every one of us is called to be a missionary. We are called to the service of God and our fellow men. And to fit us for this service should be the object of our education. It is necessary, in counsels to parents, teachers, and students, it is necessary to their complete education that students be given time to do missionary work. In other words, they won't have a complete education if they don't have time to do missionary work. Time to become acquainted with the spiritual needs of the families in the community around them. You don't have to go to uh, some remote land across the ocean somewhere. No, Focus on spiritual needs of the families and the communities around you. They should not be so loaded down with studies that they have no time to use the knowledge they have acquired. They, sh excuse me, they should be encouraged to make earnest missionary effort for those in error, becoming acquainted with them and taking to them the truth. Now, notice something about this. It says they should not be so loaded down with studies that they have no time to use the knowledge they have acquired. And this is in the context of missionary effort. What sort of knowledge do you think they must be needing to acquire here if they need the time to apply what they've acquired in the light of missionary effort? There must be missionary training involved here, right? By deduction, we can say that the purpose of this giving them the knowledge and the time to use it must be that the knowledge is how to engage in missionary effort. 
Wherever possible, students should, during the school year, when? During the school year. Not after they graduate or during summer break on a two-week mission trip when they're not in school. No, it says during the school year. They should engage in mission work. They should do missionary work in the surrounding towns and villages. They are not to look forward to a time after the school term closes when they will do some large work for God, but they should study how during their student life to yoke up with Christ in unselfish service for others. Right now, they can start putting it into practice. From our colleges and training schools, missionaries are to be sent forth to distant lands. While at school, let the students improve every opportunity to prepare for this work. When the youth give their hearts to God, your care for them should not cease. Notice what the first step here is. Helping the youth to give their hearts to God. That should be the focus. Remember we saw earlier, education and redemption are the same. We need to focus on helping our youth give their hearts to God. But after that happens, do we just say, all right, mission accomplished? No. Our efforts should not cease. What should we do then? After they give their hearts to God, lay some special responsibility upon them. Make them feel they are expected to do something. Let different branches of the missionary work be laid out systematically and let instruction and help be given so that the young may learn to act a part. We should do what? Lay responsibility upon them and make them feel they are expected to do something. We expect far too little out of our young people. We should be engaging them in active missionary labors. And this will actually prove to be very instrumental in their own salvation and the salvation of others, as I'll talk about tomorrow afternoon. Let them we should expect them to do something. Now, as never before, we saw earlier, we need to understand the true science of education. Do we understand now a bit more of why this is so important to us? That this is more than just study of academics in school? And why, if we fail to understand the true science of education, we shall never have a place in the kingdom of God? This is really serious. I want to tell you a story now. And I'm going to preface it by a quotation we have in the book Fundamentals of Education. The necessity of establishing Christian schools is urged upon me very strongly. In the schools of today, many things are taught that are a, a hindrance rather than a blessing. Schools are needed where the Word of God is made the basis of education. Satan's object is effectually gained when by perverting their ideas of education, he succeeds in enlisting parents on his side, for a wrong education often starts the mind on the road to infidelity. That's a solemn thought. The necessity of establishing Christian schools is urged upon me very strongly, she says. Schools are needed where the Word of God is made the basis of education. Sadly, there are not very many schools we can tell this story about, but there is one that is, and I'm sure there are others, and don't take that as like this is the only one, but there is one that I'm very familiar with that is shining as a bright light with incredible results. I'd like to tell you their story, a story I wish I could tell you about schools all over the world, but it is a story rarely heard, a story that almost doesn't exist. It's a story of a school that's following God's plan, a school that because it is following God's plan, has a reason to exist. Remember what the leader of education told the Advent, the leader of Japanese education in the government told the Japan mission Seventh-day Adventist men about their school? If you follow your plan, you have no reason to worry, but if you do not follow your plan, you have no reason to exist? This school has a reason to exist. In 2001, the Tanzanian, in, that's in Africa, government established the primary education program which made primary school attendance for children ages 7 to 15 compulsory according to the statistics of 2008 through 2012 released by the united nations tanzania has made a big impact in education with about 92 to 96 percent attendance recorded for both boys and girls however this figure drops drastically for secondary education with an average of only 32% of boys and 24% of girls attending. When you realize that Tanzania is one of the youngest countries on the planet, with 71% of the population aged 30 and below, 
that 32% and 24% statistic becomes rather staggering. However, many do not finish even primary school for various reasons. <clears throat> there are many factors contributing to a major education crisis in the country of Tanzania. But one in particular is very strong, and that is the plight of the vulnerable girl. Tanzania has one of the highest adolescent pregnancy rates in the world, according to the United Nations Population Fund. An average of one in every six girls, aged 15 to 19, end up pregnant annually. Most schools have mandatory pregnancy testing, and pregnant students are promptly expelled, no questions asked. So between five and 8,000 girls dropped out of school every single year between 2008 and 2011 due to pregnancy. But this figure is potentially misleading due to unknown factors like abortion, suicide, and girls dropping out of school before they can be caught and publicly shamed. Another outflow of the circumstances is the deplorable existence of approximately one million child domestic workers in the country of Tanzania. One million child workers. The short of it all is that there are large populations of both boys and girls who have been expelled from school or have simply just failed school because supposedly they were dumb and couldn't learn. They start school very early, which we've seen the research of how that can be negative for school success. What is the future for these young people? Well, typically, more often than not, the future means a life on the street, involved in crime, drugs maybe, not respected by their communities because of the failure they have experienced in education. No hope, essentially, for these youth. What can be done? Well, in 2004, the Kibidula Mission, in partnership with REACH Switzerland, decided to do something about this enormous problem. They started what is officially recognized as a vocational training center, but it is way more than that. It is unique. Agriculture is a major need in the country of Tanzania. It is a major uh, industry. And if you can grow food for yourself, you can subsist pretty well. So Kibidula began with an agriculture school, an agriculture training center specifically for primary school failures and secondary school dropouts, giving them a chance to learn a skill they can support themselves with. These young people live on three separate farm units. Right now there's about 60 students at this school. They function in three separate units. There are two for boys and one for girls of about 20 students each. And there they put into practice practical life. What they learn in the classroom about how to grow food, they go and do it. Every student has their own garden. Every student has their own orchard. Every student has their own field area. They literally grow everything they eat. And I mean everything. They, if they need oil, they grow sunflowers and press it into oil completely self-sufficient. Whatever they can't grow, they'll grow extra food, sell it, and purchase those things in the market. They grow their own food, keep their own livestock, have their own beehives, press their own oil, grow their own avocado orchards. They sell the extra crops. They're completely self-sufficient. Here's one of the little farm units there, um, uh, housing units, school units, whatever you want to call it. Uh, most of the students are living here right along with their teachers, just as we've been counseled to do, right? school homes where the teachers are mingling with the students as a family school. Here's a storage area. These are crops they have grown, corn and beans and such. This young man was making me some delicious chapatis. Well, he wasn't making them for me, but uh, he was kind enough to let me have one, which I was very thankful for. They were quite delicious. But he grew the wheat that he made for the flour. He grew the sunflowers for the oil. He didn't grow the salt, but he grew a little extra of his crops and bought some salt. Um, they're learning to be completely self-sufficient and then um, how to utilize their crops, how to function as a meaningful member of society. But remember, these three areas, physical, mental, and spiritual, they have the physical down quite well, and it's not just agriculture. They have carpentry and, and um, sewing and various other skills that they learn. But it's not just physical, right? And Kibidula realized this as the school was now successful, doing well for a couple of years, focusing just on physical training. They said, hey, we need to add the other two areas, the mental and the spiritual. But there's a problem with that mental area because uh, supposedly these students were dumb and couldn't learn. 
Many of them had failed primary school, the youngest grades, um, not respected by their communities because they were so dumb. But they said, well, we'll do what we can. They didn't have much time because of all the need, time needed for agriculture. And so they did about two hours a week in general academic study for the, the national exams. These students can then go and take the national exams, the ones that they originally failed. They score very high now with only two hours a week spent on academic study. Does the Lord's plan work of balanced education? But what about the spiritual training? They had physical, the mental was going well. How about spiritual? Well, that's a little hard to implement because these students are coming off of the street. I mean, they are not Christian, let alone Seventh-day Adventists. They have very bad backgrounds, many of them. Well, they said, let's give it a try. They worked with their teachers, the ones who were there with the students. And so they started teaching the students about the Bible, started teaching them how to study the Bible, started teaching them how to have devotions, how to have a relationship with the Lord. It was an ongoing process, but now, to date, since 2004 when the school was started, 99% of these students have left baptized Seventh-day Adventist Christians. Does God's plan work? <laughs> Please don't un misunderstand this as critical, but let's compare that to many of our modern educational systems where students go into these systems as Seventh-day Adventists and leave not Seventh-day Adventists. So I'll leave you to ponder that. Do God's methods work? Where are these young people going now? They're now respected by their communities because they have a diploma behind their name. They can now support themselves because they've learned to trade. But most importantly, they're going out as missionaries because they understand the truths that we have been entrusted with as a Seventh-day Adventist church. They're going back to their villages, transforming their villages because of the truths they have learned. Why do we not have a thousand such schools in every country on this earth? We have a work to do. We have been given a plan, a plan of, in many areas, but a special plan in education, a plan that will prepare a generation to finish the work on this earth, to bring in the kingdom of God. Can we do it in one generation? Absolutely can. Did you know Martin Luther and Melanchthon started the system of Christian schools in the nation of Germany and transformed the nation of Germany in one generation? We have way more light than Luther ever had. Can we do it in one generation? If we follow God's plan, we have no reason to fear. But if we do not follow the plan, we have no reason to exist. Let us embrace the plan and let us have a reason for existence. Because in the presence of such a teacher, of Jesus, of such opportunity for divine education, what worse than folly is it to seek an education apart from Him? To seek to be wise apart from wisdom? To be true while rejecting truth? To seek illumination apart from light? An existence without the life? To turn from the fountain of living waters and hew out broken cisterns that can hold no water? Let us follow the plan. Let's close with prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the plan you have given us. A plan which we know will work, a plan which will set us apart. Forgive us, Lord, please, for not following your plan. I pray that you'll inspire every one of us to follow that plan in our homes, wherever possible, in our schools, because, Lord, we want to go home. Help us to raise that generation to finish the work you've given us to do. Thank you for the time we've had, and we continue to ask for your blessing as Sabbath draws near. We are expecting, anticipating a rich blessing this Sabbath, and we ask in Jesus' name, amen.